text today comes to us from 1 Kings chapter 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank, then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting the mountains and breaking the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? The word of the Lord. Holy God, we've gathered here to place our lives in front of your scriptures, asking that your spirit would use it to speak your word into our lives. We might be transformed closer into the image of the word made flesh. Amen. This morning I want to speak about two very different mountains that are striking metaphors for two very different experiences of spirituality. A few weeks ago, we gathered, as the text says, all of Israel on Mount Carmel to watch a great contest between Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal. They were competing for our hearts. Through most of the day, the prophets of Baal danced around their altar. They cut themselves and they cried out, O Baal, answer us. But there was no response, no answer. Then Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord, made a sacrifice on it. And he simply said, answer me, O God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, answer me. And suddenly a bolt of fire shot down from the sky. The altar exploded into flames. And the people fell on their face and said, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. That's Mount Carmel. It's a place of dramatic spirituality. The odds are against you. You ask for God to come to de for deliverance. You ask for God to answer you, and God answers in the most dramatic ways. Maybe you've been to Mount Carmel. 
Maybe you were in trouble and desperate, and you cried out for God to answer you. Maybe you had needed a job, maybe you were in financial trouble, or maybe you had a cherished relationship that was unraveling, and you cried out, answer me, oh God, answer me. Maybe you're engaged in a ministry, and like Elijah, the odds are against you, and you know that it's going to take a miracle for this project to work, and so you pray, answer me, oh God, answer me. Or maybe you were very, very sick once. Or worse, you had a loved one who was very, very sick. The doctors gave up hope and said, at this point it would take a miracle. So you prayed for a miracle. And the miracle came. And you were changed by what you saw. It's embarrassing, and you actually don't like talking about it that much, because you're afraid that people are going to try to explain it away. But you know what you saw, and you know that you'll never be the same. Sometimes, God's style comes with flair. But be careful. Because it's always after the miracles that you're most susceptible to burnout. After Mount Carmel, Elijah begins to overfunction. He prays all by himself for the rain to come so that there'd be a release from the drought. And he prays and he prays until finally he pulls the rain down out of the sky. And then he races back to Jezreel, 17 miles, and he runs ahead of King Ahab's chariot. But when he gets there, he discovers that Jezebel is waiting for him. Jezebel, you remember, is the one who introduced Baal worship to Israel, so she's not real thrilled with Elijah's triumph on Mount Carmel. In fact, she says she's going to kill him in a day. Now you would think that after everything that Elijah has seen on Mount Carmel, when he hears this threat from Jezebel, he would kick his head back and scoff and say, ha, what can a puny queen do in the face of a god who throws fire down from the sky? But that's not what happened. What happened is that Elijah became afraid, and he ran away. He goes out into the desert a day's journey. He sits down under a broom tree, and he says, God, just go ahead and kill me before the queen does. So God sends an angel to invite Elijah to come to a very different mountain, Mount Horeb. Elijah takes the 40-day journey to get there. Always 40 days. <laughs> Mount Horeb is very different than Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is the place where the crowds go, all of Israel. It's easy access to get there. In fact, today you can actually drive to the top. Mount Horeb it's a long journey, and it's a hard, lonely climb reserved for the, those who have lost their holy visions. Mount Carmel is Easter in a packed church where the sacred drama is overwhelming. Brass is everywhere. <laughs> Mount Horeb is where you go at two in the morning when you're alone with your fears. They're both valid places of spirituality. And one, God is as obvious as the summer sun that shines on your face and warms you. The other is the lonelier, wintry experience of God, where you take in the gray deep into your soul. When he arrived at this cave in Mount Horeb, the Lord told him to come out and stand upon the mountain. And there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting the mountains and busting apart the rocks, 
but we're told the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, and the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard the sound of sheer silence, he wrapped his face in his mantle because he knew he was in the presence of God. This sound of sheer silence is sometimes also translated as a still, small voice. It has the connotation of a silence that is so strong it is speaking. Now, Elijah was a man of fire and big words and lots of drama. But now he had to find God in the silence. In the still, small voice of hope that is reserved for those who are ready to be quiet enough to listen. After this incredible experience, the Lord again says to Elijah, what, what are you doing here? And Elijah again says, actually he says this three times, I, I was zealous for God, I, the Lord of hosts, but I'm the only one. And then he says it again, I'm the only one, and now they're trying to kill me. If I was God, I would have thought of killing him myself at this point. <laughs> you know that you've burned out when you start saying things like, I'm the only one. No one in this family understands me. Nobody else in this school cares about justice. I'm the only one. No one in this church is anything but a hypocrite. And they're working me so hard, they're trying to kill me. I'm the only one. In response to this, the Lord, ever gracious, does not kill Elijah, but nor does he cuddle him with a lot of poor, sweet baby talk. And he doesn't actually commend Elijah for his faithfulness and his hard work. Essentially, he just tells him to get back to work. And he says a couple of other things that are important. He says, actually, there are 7,000 people around you who have not bowed their knee to Baal. You're not the only one. <laughs> and then he tells them to make some plans for the future, to anoint Elijah, who will be his successor, and Haziel and Jehiel will be the new kings. Now this is how the will of God is revealed. Not in the high drama, always, that you find at Carmel. Now it's revealed in things like the progress of generations towards a future filled with hope. Anoint a successor. There's other leadership coming. And in the, the very quiet, ordinary faithfulness of those around you that you're not seeing. You have to know how to find God, not just on Carmel, when the drama is obvious, but also how to behold God in the quiet, ordinary faithfulness of those around you and your own calling and the promise of a future filled with hope. Because if you can't find God in the quiet and in the ordinary, then you're gonna be tempted to make yourself extraordinary. And that's just the best recipe I know for burnout. Because it won't be long before you'll find out that you're actually not that spectacular. But for those who pray, for those who know about the long road up to Mount Horeb, 
the discovery that you're not so spectacular is always a call to worship the God who is. And when you see that, even in the silent places, even in the ordinary places, then you have all you need to get back to work. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.